Hey, welcome back to our biological wastewater treatment training series. I'm Larry Moore. Uh, in our first presentation, we talked about wastewater quality. Uh, today, we're going to move into the more fun stuff, and that's an introduction to biological wastewater treatment. Uh, let's talk about uh, the topics we're going to cover today. Uh, objectives, definitions, role of microorganisms, and biological processes. So, Basically, what I'm going to do is uh, introduce you to biological wastewater treatment, especially for those who are novices. We're going to lay a lot of information on you, and we'll try to explain it in a way you can understand. But as we get on into the additional presentations of the series, uh, the information will become more and more familiar to you. I do want to mention that uh, much of the information that I use is from Metcalf and Eddy, the fourth edition and have also used information provided by the Water Environment Federation. Let's talk about uh, the objectives of biological wastewater treatment. Well, obviously we wanna remove dissolved and particulate organic matter that's in the wastewater. And we're going to do that primarily by biological degradation. And we're gonna end up with uh, acceptable end products, primarily being carbon dioxide, water, and other end products. Uh, let me mention briefly, uh, one thing we need to understand as we talk about biological treatment is we need to understand the differences in the, in the sizes of particles and the way we classify them. First of all, we have dissolved solids and Dr. Moore's definition of dissolved solid is less than 0 0.005 microns in size. A colloidal solid, according to Dr. Moore, is 0 0.005 microns to one micron in size. And then a suspended solid is larger than one micron in size. Again, that's a rough estimate and some folks may slightly disagree with that, but that's generally acceptable. But the thing you need to understand is the size of the particle is very important in determining how we will remove it from the wastewater. We'll have suspended solids, again, as I explained in the first presentation, suspended solids are greater than about one or 1.2 microns. And uh, in raw wastewater, raw municipal wastewater, we'll have uh, a moderate concentration of what I call inert suspended solids. They're not, inert means they're not going to be biodegradable. But we can still remove those suspended solids because they will get uh, bound up in the biological flock and actually settle in the settling basin. Um, another objective is to remove nitrogen and phosphorus. That's a neat thing about the activated sludge process. We can manip manipulate it in a number of ways to achieve biological nitrogen and biological phosphorus removal. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. And another thing we can do uh, is remove trace organic compounds, priority pollutants. Ordinarily, we don't design a biological wastewater treatment plant to remove trace organic compounds. But again, if they're present and they're below a threshold concentration, those trace organic compounds may be removed quite readily. And that's a good thing. So biological treatment, what are we trying to do? Well, let's think back. Uh, and most of you weren't alive uh, 50, 60 years ago. I'm 70 and I, I can remember it a little bit. Uh, but back in the 50s and 60s, uh, basically what we did in many cases was we satisfied the oxygen demand of municipal and industrial organic wastewaters out in the receiving stream. And that oxygen demand usually used up or occasionally used up the oxygen in the stream and caused a massive fish kill. So what we want to do is satisfy that oxygen demand in the treatment process so that when we discharge that waste into the stream, we don't adversely affect the oxygen resources in the stream and we protect fish and other aquatic life. We're gonna use naturally occurring microorganisms. These are basically soil microorganisms. And we're gonna use controlled facilities uh, wherein uh, we will have a certain temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen concentration, uh, ORP, oxidation redu reduction potential uh, value, these are environmental conditions that will uh, significantly impact the functioning of the microorganisms. And then we have time restraints that we have to deal with. We may design a biological reactor for a one hour detention time 
or it may be designed for a 24 hour detention time. And so we have to deal with those constraints that we have in the treatment process. And a municipal wastewater treatment plant is primarily designed to remove compatible pollutants. That's mainly BOD and suspended solids. That's normally uh, what we design biological treatment plants to remove. But these incompatible, especially organic uh, pollutants uh, and even heavy metals, they can be removed in the process coincidentally. So again, that's a good thing in some ways. And then if we get too much metals in our waste sludge, that may be a problem for us. But at any rate, we have to keep that in mind. Let's think about the critical aspects of biological treatment. Again, we got to create an environment where the bacteria flourish and do what we want them to do. We're going to manipulate the process by the way we design the plant and the way the operator operates it. But again, we're usually dealing with a, a, an organic wastewater that's biodegradable for the most part. Well, so we got plenty of organic matter, but we've also got to supply the nutrients that the bacteria need same nutrients that you and I have to have in our diet. The macronutrients are nitrogen and phosphorus. We need more of those. And then we have micronutrients, potassium, calcium, sulfur, chloride, iron, molybdenum, cobalt, cobalt, zinc, copper, manganese. All of those are micronutrients that the bacteria need in small concentrations and that you and I also need in small concentrations. And so, in municipal wastewater, we don't normally have to worry about the nutrient concentrations because generally we have a lot more of these nutrients than we need. But in, in industrial wastewater treatment, we may have a high strength organic waste that can be nutrient deficient. So we have to be aware of that and we can artificially supply the necessary nutrients. And the general rule in terms of the macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, the general rule is for every 100 pounds of BOD, we need uh, five pounds of nitrogen, I missed a slash there, and one pound of phosphorus. That's a ballpark estimate. Now, when we as environmental engineers design an activated sludge process, we'll calculate the N and P requirements uh, more accurately than that, but that's a good ballpark estimate. We want to keep the pH in a range where the bacteria are happy. Uh, usually we say six to nine is adequate. Uh, really would like to keep it in the range of about six and a half to eight because that, that will be uh, optimum for the bacteria in most cases. We want to keep the temperature in acceptable range because temperature affects metabolic rates. Um, and what we'd like to avoid is uh, we don't want the mixed liquor or the reactor temperature Typically, we don't want it to exceed 35 degrees C because if it exceeds 35 degrees C, then we may lose some of our higher organisms such as protozoa and that can adversely affect the process. And again, we wanna avoid um, toxic or priority pollutants that can inhibit or interfere with our treatment process. Things like phenol, uh, bis 2 ethylhexyl thiolate and other uh, priority organic compounds. So, so if we get those from industry, we, we will use our pre-treatment program. If, if they would be discharging levels that can create inhibition or interference, then we'll regulate them through the pre-treatment program and require pre-treatment um, by the industry to remove those to acceptable levels. And then if the, 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 the process can handle the concentrations coming in, then uh, we can usually uh, deal with that and the process will work well. Let's talk about the diff different metabolic functions. Uh, we have aerobic processes, anaerobic processes, and anoxic processes. And we'll use all of these depending on what we're trying to accomplish in the treatment plant. Aerobic processes take place in the presence of molecular oxygen. We'll spry the oxygen usually with the aeration system and we'll degrade the organic, biodegradable organic constituents and end up with biomass, carbon dioxide, water, um, energy, and other end products. In anaerobic processes, they take place in the absence of oxygen and in the absence of nitrite and nitrate nitrogen. And the, the biological metabolism will yield uh, less biomass than aerobic processes, significantly less biomass, carbon dioxide, methane, 
energy for the bacteria and other end products. And then anoxic processes, those are processes that take place generally in the absence of oxygen, and, but with the presence of nitrite and nitrate. And anoxic processes are primarily what we use to achieve biological nitrogen removal, also uh, called denitrification. Facultative processes, that, let's say a facultative lagoon for a small town. Well, in a facultative lagoon, we may have aerobic metabolism up at the uh, top layer of the water. In the middle layer of the water, it may be uh, anoxic metabolism where oxygen levels are very low, but we have nitrate and nitrite. And in the bottom, in the sludge zone of the lagoon, we don't have any oxygen, we don't have any nitrates or nitrites, and we have anaerobic metabolism. Or we can design the activated sludge process so that we incorporate aerobic reactors, anoxic reactors, and anaerobic reactors in different combinations that we'll get into in subsequent uh, uh, training presentations. But that allows us to achieve biological nutrient removal. But again, we as a design engineer and we as the operator, we're going to manipulate the treatment process to achieve the desired metabolism. And again, a combination of aerobic and oxygen anaerobic metabolism will give us an opportunity to achieve significant biological nutrient removal. Well, in biological freedom, we have suspended growth processes. Activated sludge is generally a suspended growth process. That means the microorganisms are suspended in the wastewater that they're treating. And then the organics and nutrients and other constituents in the water will be available to the bacteria. An attached growth process, also called a fixed film process, this is where the microorganisms are attached to some type of medium. It might be rock, it might be wood, it might be gravel. And, and, and the microorganisms are attached to the media and we pass the wastewater across or over the, the media that contain the bacteria and we call those attached growth processes. And in lagoon processes, those are uh, again, typically suspended growth processes where the microorganisms are suspended in the wastewater and the lagoons will have different aspect ratios. That means different length to width ratios and different depths and we can achieve biological treatment in lagoons. And lagoons are, are generally uh, not acceptable or not uh, usable by medium to large size cities because they generally do not achieve the desired removal efficiencies that we need. But for small towns discharging to large streams, lagoon processes are very economical and may indeed be acceptable and allow that small town to meet the requirements of its NP, NPDES permit. Biological nutrient removal, you know, 40 years ago, we weren't so concerned about removing nitrogen and phosphorus as we are today, but because the regulatory agencies are putting total nitrogen and total phosphorus limits in their NPDES permits, it has become much more uh, prevalent today and we need to be aware of it and, and understand how we can remove uh, nitrogen phosphorus from the wastewater biologically. Now we can also remove nitrogen phosphorus from the wastewater physically, chemically, but generally in municipal wastewater treatment we'd like to accomplish it uh, biologically because it's generally more cost effective and uh, more environmentally uh, friendly. Now we'll achieve biological phosphorus removal primarily by incorporating an anaerobic step in the treatment process. The uh, desired uh, sequence of reactors is anaerobic followed by aerobic and that will allow us to achieve biological phosphorus removal and we'll talk more about that uh, later on. And in a typical activated sludge process where we're primarily trying to remove carbonaceous organic matter and suspended solids, then uh, uh, we may use just an aerobic reactor because again, we're concerned about removing uh, CBOD. Nitrification, we talked a little bit about it in our first presentation. Again, it's a two-step process. 
Then the first step, ammonia nitrogen is oxidized to nitrite nitrogen, which is NO2 nitrogen. And the bacteria that do that are called the, the ammonia oxidizing bacteria. The second reaction is the oxidation of nitrite nitrogen to nitrate nitrogen. Nitrate is NO3 nitrogen. The bacteria that achieve that for us are the uh, nitrite oxidizing bacteria. But again, a two-step process. It consumes uh, quite a bit of oxygen. For every pound of ammonia nitrogen that's oxidized to nitrate nitrogen, that'll consume theoretically 4.5 pounds of oxygen. Um, realistically or actually, it'll consume about four point, every pound of ammonia nitrogen is converted to nitrate nitrogen will consume about 4.3 pounds of oxygen. So when we talk about nitrification, please understand that that is not biological nitrogen removal. Nitrification simply is, is nitrogen conversion. We're converting ammonia nitrogen to nitrate nitrogen. And obviously we'd much rather discharge nitrate nitrogen to a stream than ammonia nitrogen. Because I always say ammonia nitrogen has three strikes against it. Ammonia nitrogen is toxic to fish. Ammonia nitrogen exerts a high oxygen demand and it can also uh, promote eutrophication or excessive aquatic plant growth in the receiving stream. Nitrate nitrogen is not toxic. It, uh, it's the highest oxidized form of nitrogen, so it doesn't exert an oxygen demand. But again, please remember that nitrification is not nitrogen removal. It is simply conversion of nitrite nitrogen, excuse me, of ammonia nitrogen, primarily to nitrate nitrogen. Now, denitrification is biological nitrogen removal. Under anoxic conditions, we take away the oxygen so the bacteria don't operate in the aerobic mode, and then they look for their next preferred electron acceptor, and, and they'll look for nitrate, and nitrate is present in the absence of oxygen. They'll use nitrate as their electron acceptor, and they'll operate in the anoxic mode They'll strip the oxygen off of the nitrate and produce nitrogen gas. Nitrogen gas is not very soluble in water. It will bubble out of the water and end up in the uh, atmosphere. So that's how we get biological nitrogen removal. But again, metabolically speaking, let me mention this here because it's very important. Metabolically speaking, there are three uh, essential requirements of bacteria. Uh, and for human beings as well. Most living organisms, a source of carbon, source of energy, and a terminal electron acceptor. As human beings and, as, and heterotrophic bacteria, they have to have carbon in the form of organic carbon. And that's the, they will use that organic carbon and oxidize the CO2 and water uh, to generate energy. Uh, we also have to have uh, uh, organic matter to grow new cell mass because about 50% of cell mass is carbon. So we have to have a source of carbon, a source of energy. And when we oxidize organic matter to CO2 and water, that generates energy for the bacterial cell, also is generating energy in our body as we speak. And then why is a terminal electron acceptor needed? Well. In, in, in bacteria and in human beings and in most living organisms, most of the energy that's generated to keep those organisms alive is generated through the electron transport system. Don't wanna get into a, a lot of that because uh, we can get bogged down in the biochemistry, but uh, there's a series of transfer of electrons and at certain points along that oxygen transfer pathway, energy is generated but you have to have a terminal electron acceptor to receive the electrons at the end of the reaction to make the process complete. Let's talk a little bit about stabilization. When we talk about stabilization, usually we're talking about uh, oxidizing the organic matter in our waste sludge. So when we stabilize sludge, we're trying to reduce its odor causing potential. Uh, we're trying to reduce uh, the 
uh, pathogen content of the sludge. We're trying to destroy organic matter. We're trying to reduce the vector attraction potential of the sludge. So we don't want the sludge when it's disposed of on the land to attract flies and birds and rats and other vectors. So we do that through stabilization and we can aerobically stabilize the, sl the sludge. We can anaerobically stabilize the sludge. Substrate is another term we need to be aware of. Uh, that's the organic matter nutrient that uh, is going to be the limiting uh, nutrient in the wastewater and it will control the, the rate of the metabolic reaction. For instance, in most municipal wastewater treatment plants, the growth limiting substrate is biodegradable organic matter, carbonaceous BOD. We're talking about nitrification, the growth limiting substrate there will be the ammonia nitrogen in the wastewater. So again, it's the critical substrate that's being used by the bacteria. So uh, in biological wastewater treatment, where we're primarily concerned about removing biodegradable organic matter, this is an equation that I showed you in the first presentation. And it's actually a combination of two equations, organics plus oxygen plus ammonia plus orthophosphate. Uh, goes to new cells, carbon dioxide, water, and energy. And, and so this reaction represents not only biological synthesis or biological growth, but it also represents uh, uh, biochemical oxidation or, or biochemical uh, uh, energy production. So, if, so it's the combination of the two, synthesis or the growth reaction and also the energy or oxidation reaction. Now, if we were to break it out, the synthesis reaction would be organics plus ammonia plus phosphate going to new cells. That's the synthesis or growth reaction. Doesn't consume oxygen. The energy oxidation reaction is organics plus oxygen going to CO2 and water to generate the energy for uh, the bacterial cells. Again, this reaction is going on in our bodies right now to keep us alive in our roughly 70 uh, trillion cells. But new, new, new bacterial cells or new cells in our body are generated through the synthesis reaction and we generate energy through the uh, energy or oxidation reaction. So the role of microbes in biological wastewater treatment, again, uh, they have different roles. We may be using the bacteria to remove nitrogen and phosphorus from the wastewater. Uh, we may be using the bacteria, the, the nitrifying bacteria to convert ammonia to nitrite and then to nitrate nitrogen. Again, that's uh, nitrogen conversion. Or under anoxic conditions, we may be using the bacteria under anoxic condition, that's the absence of oxygen, but with the presence of nitrite and nitrate, again, to stimulate biological denitrification. And in biological phosphorus removal, we're trying to, uh, uh, again, get the bacteria to take up and store large amounts of, of uh, inorganic phosphorus in their cell mass. And again, we primarily do that by incorporating an anaerobic reactor in the uh, process followed by an aerobic reactor. The activated sludge process normally is a continuous flow treatment process. We can, we can use batch activated sludge treatment known as sequencing batch reactors, but most municipal wastewater treatment plants are continuous flow systems. And we have, again, a suspended growth uh, of microorganisms and the aeration system uh, that primarily does two things for us. It supplies oxygen to the biomass, but it also provides turbulence and keep the microorganisms suspended and in intimate contact with the nutrients in the wastewater. And we said previously, the microorganisms will oxidize the soluble and chloral organic matter uh, to carbon dioxide and water in the presence of oxygen to, uh, again, achieve carbonaceous BOD removal. But as I said earlier, some of that organic matter is going to be channeled into the synthesis reaction. We're going to generate excess biomass 
that we have to waste from the process. The, the organic matter that is channeled into the energy reaction is converted to CO2 and water primarily. That organic matter is basically destroyed because we're converting it into gaseous end products. But the biomass that goes to the secondary clarifier, final clarifier, we settle it to produce a high quality effluent. And again, most of it will be returned back to the aeration tank in the return sludge. So when we look at the overall treatment process, we use influent pretreatment to remove large solids and grit from the wastewater uh, to protect the treatment plant. Uh, the aeration basin there, uh, aeration basin is where we have biological metabolism taking place. Secondary clarifier is where we settle the biomass. Return activated sludge that allows us to keep an adequate biomass inventory in the in the biological reactor and the waste activated sludge, that's primarily how we control the activated sludge process. But here we see a, a diagram of the entire treatment process. Uh, the preliminary treatment is screening and grit removal, again, to remove offending solids uh, in the raw wastewater. Primary clarifier may or may not be needed if we're using conventional activated sludge, we may very well need a primary clarifier. If we're using extended aeration activated sludge, which includes oxidation ditches and sequence, sequencing batch reactors, typically we will not need a primary clarifier. Then we get into the yellow uh, units, which is the activated sludge process. And we take the sludge from the bottom of the secondary clarifier. That'll be returned back to the reactor to maintain our, our inventory of biomass. And then we may or may not need filters depending upon uh, the effluent limits in our NPDES permit. This shows you a, an aerobic reactor. In this case, it's a fairly long reactor uh, compared to its width. And uh, so this is closer to a plug flow reactor because it has a uh, a great length compared to the width of the basin. And a plug flow reactor is our most efficient type of biological reactor. Again, the return sludge, and, and, and just to give you a feel, uh, the return sludge flow rate will be approximately, in most cases, be approximately 25% to 150% of the raw wastewater flow rate. Um, when we waste sludge, typically we waste it from the sludge return line. The waste sludge will be a much smaller flow rate. Normally the waste sludge flow rate uh, will be about 0.5% uh, to 3% of the raw wastewater flow rate. Again, the secondary clarifier is extremely important because we have to be able to settle the biomass and in order to create a high quality effluent going over the effluent weirs of the clarifier. Now that presents a challenge for us because the, the specific gravity of the biomass is about 1.05. Specific gravity of water is one, so that's not a big difference. But if the process is working well, the biomass will settle well in the secondary clarifier and we can produce a high quality effluent. Again, we can use uh, uh, the activated sludge process for nitrogen removal. And there we need to uh, make sure that the dissolved oxygen concentration is less than uh, 0.3 milligrams per liter, because if the dissolved oxygen concentration is over 0.3 milligram per liter, the facultative bacteria uh, in, in the wastewater, uh, they're going to operate in the aerobic mode. And again, uh, facultative bacteria, they can operate in the aerobic mode, the anoxic mode, or the anaerobic mode, and we manipulate the process. We manipulate the oxygen level to achieve the desired metabolism. So for anoxic metabolism, biological nitrogen removal, we want the DO to be between 0, 0.0 and 0 0.3 milligrams per liter. And we want the, there to be readily degradable organic substrate for the bacteria, because the higher the concentration of readily degradable substrate, the higher the rate of denitrification. So typically what we like to do is 
use what we call a pre-anoxic zone. In other words, we locate the anoxic zone ahead of the aerobic zone. And typically what we'll do is we'll return mixed liquor from the end of the aerobic zone back to the anoxic zone. And the primary reason we do that is to get the nitrates coming out of the aerobic zone back to the anoxic zone so that we have an adequate amount of nitrates so that we have a good anoxic metabolism. Now we'll get some nitrates returned in the activated return activated sludge. But again, we'd like to return at a rate of about two to four times the influent flow rate. So in other words, if the flow rate coming in is one MGD, typically we want the return mixed liquor flow rate to be two to four MGD to get the nitrates back to the anoxic zone. So again, uh, in uh, an anoxic zone, um, the nitrite and nitrate will be biologically converted to nitrogen gas, and that's how we achieve nitrogen removal. And another advantage of an, an anoxic reactor is that we're going to generate alkalinity, and we'll generate about half the alkalinity that's actually consumed in the nitrification reaction. When we convert ammonia to nitrate, that consumes 7.14 uh, Every pound of ammonia that is converted to nitrate, that consumes 7.14 pounds of alkalinity. But in denitrification, for every pound of nitrate nitrogen that's converted to nitrogen gas, will actually create 3.14, uh, 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 excuse me, 3.57, 3.57 uh, pounds of uh, alkalinity. Uh, so again, we talked about the uh, anoxic zone and very important to recycle mixed liquor from the aerobic zone to the front of the anoxic zone if we're using the pre-anoxic arrangement. We can also place the anoxic zone after the aerobic zone. We don't typically do that because the denitri denitrification rate in the post-anoxic zone will generally be about one-eighth to one third the denitrification rate in the pre-anoxic zone. And the reason for that is, is if we use a post-anoxic zone, most of the organic substrate has been degraded by the time it passes through the aerobic zone. So again, that's the main reason we want to have the anoxic zone typically ahead of the aerobic zone. Uh, another thing uh, that you need to be aware of is the nitrate concentration doesn't really impact the rate of denitrification. Uh, the rate of denitrification depends primarily on two things. Again, the concentration of readily degradable organic substrate and the DO concentration. And the ideal DO concentration in the anoxic reactor is 0.0, .0 milligrams per liter because that'll give us our highest denitrification rate. Uh, if, if we design the activated sludge for biological phosphorus removal, uh, normally we'll have an anaerobic reactor followed by an aerobic reactor. And, and, and in the anaerobic reactor, we utilize our phosphorus accumulating organisms. We call them PAOs, phosphorus accumulating organisms. And in the anaerobic reactor, these phosphorus accumulating organisms, they're going to readily take up biodegradable organic matter, and they're going to store it as polyhydroxybutyrate. And at the same time, they release dissolved orthophosphate into solution. Now that sounds uh, counterintuitive. We're, we're, we're going to actually increase the dissolved phosphorus concentration in the anaerobic reactor. In the raw municipal wastewater, we may have seven milligram per liter of phosphorus. In the anaerobic reactor, we would typically expect 30 to 50 milligram per liter of dissolved phosphorus in the wastewater. But that's okay. We're going to remove it when we get to that aerobic reactor. So when we reach the uh, aerobic reactor, 
these phosphorus accumulating organisms, they have all this stored organic matter in the form of polyhydroxybutyrate. When they get to the aerobic zone and are exposed to oxygen, they shift into aerobic mode. They start readily oxidizing this stored organic matter. And then they take up significant quantities of phosphorus from solution. And these phosphorus accumulating organisms, again, about 20 to 30% by weight of their cell mass will be phosphorus. Ordinary bacteria will have about 2% by weight uh, phosphorus as their cell, in their cell mass. So again, we call this luxury uptake of phosphorus and that's how we get a biological phosphorus removal. So that's a quick introduction to biological wastewater treatment. Uh, I hope uh, you were able to absorb most of that. We're going to get into all of that in more detail in subsequent uh, training uh, presentations. But again, thank you for uh, participating today. And if you would like to contact me, you have my email address there, or you can contact Tom Winning at Oak Ridge National Labs. And again, hope this presentation today is very, very beneficial to you again because a very brief introduction into biological treatment. We're gonna really build on it in subsequent training sessions. Thank you.